just wanted to welcome everybody to our first episode of what I call the Complex Case Discussion Series. Uh, we're going to be doing a monthly uh, event uh, joined by some colleagues um, to really discuss cases and take this to kind of a conversation level of real life uh, situations. So today I am joined by four, well, three, uh, including myself four, Three good friends, colleagues. I've known these guys for a long time. We have treated many patients together. First, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Flavia Rossetto, prosthodontist in Chevy Chase. Thank you for being here. Uh, our second guest um, and third guest uh, partners, uh, both endodontists in Chevy Chase, Dr. Piru Zia and Reza Farshe, uh, some of the two of the finest endodontists uh, that I've ever worked with. Uh, we have had the pleasure of uh, collaborating on many patients over the years, and it's just really wonderful to have you guys uh, on board. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Fantastic. All right. And here's the team. Um, so today's case, um, I'm going to present this case. Now, just to be clear, this is a case that I treated by Dr. Rosetta, Dr. Farshe, and Dr. Zia were not involved in the treatment of this patient. But I think there's a lot of interesting points about this case that um, I think will uh, teach us many different things to think about. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. So this is a 26-year-old patient who was seen for evaluation of trauma one day after she had a fall. Uh, it was a bike accident. So she had avulsion of tooth number nine um, that had actually fallen on the ground. The tooth was picked up with hand. It was wrapped in a tissue paper, according to her report. And then she went to the emergency room. At that point, the tooth was, I think, irrigated and was re-implanted. By the time it was re-implanted back into the socket, uh, it um, was approximately three to four hours uh, later. And what uh, patients uh, really appear, uh, showed here is uh, initially in the clinical exam, uh, teeth number eight, nine, and 10 were involved. Tooth number eight, fracture, L is class two. There was a pulp exposure with no mobility or displacement. Tooth number nine, fractured class, uh, Ellis class one, at a three out of three mobility. That was a tooth that was avulsed, of course, and it was replaced in a delayed fashion. And tooth number 10 uh, had a Ellis fracture uh, type one, no mobility and no, no displacement. So her periapical x rays um, basically showed. Um, enlarged, widened PDL space on tooth number nine, that was the avulsed tooth. Tooth number eight and 10 appeared to be intact aside from the incisal fractures. And the comb beam CT scan, which is the imaging that was done at the time of her presentation, kind of showed um, the um, intact alveolus on all three teeth. Um, very thin bone on number nine, and of course the widened PDL space. Here is the, uh, the CBCT on tooth number nine, uh, showing the malpositioned tooth within the socket. It's not seated all the way in. It was simply just placed in the socket. It was not splinted. It was not held with anything, but just really just laid in there. Uh, but we can appreciate that there is bone uh, on the buccal aspect, even though it's thin. So what are the treatment plan considerations? So um, I think this is a good time to really talk about this case. Uh, and I think from a multidisciplinary standpoint and just to summarize the clinical uh, exams aside from um, everything that I described, tooth number nine was also in hyper occlusion when the patient was biting down it showed that it was uh, clearly in hyperocclusion. So I'm gonna open this up as to a surgical restorative endodontic um, assessment and planning. 
Um, I'll start first, and then I'm going to turn to um, Dr. Um, uh, Farshe and Dr. Zia about the endodontics and then the restorative implications. From a surgical standpoint, of course, what are the considerations? The, the considerations are how we can achieve a stability of any teeth that may be able we can save. Um, if there are teeth that are mobile that we can salvage, whether to splint them, whether to uh, extract them if they're non-restorable or if they have poor prognosis. Uh, certainly to uh, repair of any lacerations, management of any gingival lacerations, and management of any dental alveolar type of fractures. Obviously, in this case, we don't have necessarily a dental alveolar fracture, so really the primary surgical intervention for the trauma is really localized management of minor gingival uh, laceration or a contusion, and uh, management of the tooth number nine, which uh, from a surgical standpoint and long-term standpoint, I thought it had a, a poor prognosis. Um, so, uh, and that's uh, one of the key factors in the decision, the treatment uh, going on. So let me turn uh, and I wanna kind of ask, uh, you know, when I'm given a situation like this, patient walks into my office, um, right away I have to think about two other things. What are the endodontic in, uh, implications of these three teeth uh, right away, as well as the restorative? So Piruz, Reza, tell me, tell me what you think about a patient like this uh, at, at early phases of treatment. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, um, thank you for, for having included us. It's always a bit intimidating to have Reza on the same panel because he, uh, he knows more than, uh, uh, he knows more than many, uh, but uh, you know uh, we live in a in a bit of a bubble in many ways here in Washington D.C., uh, where patients have access to a lot of different kinds of treatment. Let me just ask, uh, and and in in collaboration with Reza, let me just ask, you know, what would what would we have done? What would a typical dentist have done had this occurred where there wasn't really a lot of alternatives for care? What, what could they have done to have increased the prognosis, which in this case, I agree with you, is, 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 is guarded? What are the steps you would have taken if a patient had, had come in looking like this? Um, and I'm gonna throw out a, a few of those steps and, I'm, I'm, and then I'm gonna let uh, Reza chime in. Obviously, this tooth has not been placed in the socket all the way. So uh, it would be, it would, at this stage, it would be nice, it would have been nice to numb the patient up and to make sure that this tooth is, is placed all the way back where it belongs, number one. Number two, you want to think about um, uh, stabilizing the tooth and what the AAE recommends is, is, a, uh, is a splint um, uh, sort of with a Point four, with a sort of a 0.4 wire for about one or two weeks. But it's very important that early on you try and minimize the possibility of this tooth um, A, uh, becoming necrotic, which is very likely to do, and B, uh, minimizing the chances of ankylosis by dressing the tooth with some form of corticosteroid. Uh, then it's important to pay, place the patient on, on antibiotics as well. Um, and the splint is going to stay on for, for a couple of uh, weeks. Reza, what are, what are your thoughts with regard to some of those steps? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, what you first said is, is it really, uh, it, it sits with me, and it's, and it's such a crucial point that, you know, what are other folks going to do in areas where there's no access to specialty care? You know, how can you deliver optimal care for these patients you know, trauma cases go up uh, statistically seasonally and kids love to be outdoors and accidents happen. And, and the best I can say is, is it's up to uh, the, the neighborhood or general dentist in that area to enhance their education, whether it's online or resources. Uh, you know, AAE.org has a fantastic resource. There is a, a website, IADT.org, International Association of Dental Traumatology. All of their resources and guidelines are free of charge. There's an app called Tooth SOS, um, steps to do when you're uh, you know, encountering different kinds of, of, of trauma and how to manage them. 
And then as for patients, you know, there's these uh, save a tooth jars that you can buy again from the AAE. So you can kind of uh, put the tooth in the jar where it's a safe medium, it'll preserve it. So these are all little things you can do in areas where you don't have access to specialized care in order to intervene and manage your patients uh, in the best way possible. So I encourage you guys to, that, that don't have access to, to specialists in your area to, to look at those resources uh, for optimum information. Um, as far as uh, this case goes, I think um, anytime you have trauma, it's paramount to have an endodontist and a surgeon sort of be the, the, the initial triagers, if you will, uh, management uh, in a complementary fashion, sharing information uh, in terms of prognosis uh, and managing it, uh, you know, in the best possible way. Um, that's uh, really the only other two things I can add to what, what you said, Peruz, which is 100% uh, correct in terms of, of management of these cases. What did we leave out, guys? Flavio, um, Hamid. So well, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think I think one of the uh, uh, critical things that I wanted to point out about the endo, and this is sort of my perspective as a surgeon, uh, right away when I'm seeing a patient uh, like this, I'm already preparing them that there's going to have to be an endodontic evaluation assessment in a very timely fashion after this treatment. Um, and just to clarify is that um, how soon after the trauma should they be receiving their very first endodontic evaluation and assessment? Within days, one week, uh, does it depend on certain factors? As, as soon as is practical. Yeah, it's uh, not, there's never too soon. I think that's... Okay. As, so uh, literally as, within uh, even a day or two uh, to get that initial assessment and get a baseline assessment. Wait. Yeah, so if, if, if she had uh, so, walked so into So Flavio... Your... Um, yeah. So if she would have walked into your practice and you had no choice but to want to make the best of what is a very bad situation. By the way, don't get me wrong. I agree with what you did and the case turned out beautifully. So I'm not criticizing that at all. I'm just saying if you had no other options, you would have numbed her up. You would have replaced the tooth uh, fully back into the socket. You would have placed a flexible splint and you would have sent her straight away for us to uh, make an access, put letter mix or corticosteroid into the canal to try and minimize the possibility of ankylosis down the road, which is a, which is a problem with, with Avol's T. Um, and then we would have brought them back in a couple of weeks to, to do root canal therapy with interim calcium hydroxide uh, treatment. You would have also placed the patient on some right. antibiotics, um, uh, doxycycline okay. or yeah. amoxicillin, depending on the rate. That's, that's Thank about you. it. Uh, so Flavio, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, you know, th these, these patients uh, really have an emotional experience. Uh, I can't tell you that how many times patients who have this type of trauma to the anterior teeth, uh, they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty shaken up. Um, aside from the accident itself, it's right in the aesthetic zone. Uh, and it is, uh, it, is, it is a tough experience uh, to, to go through. Uh, so in terms of getting these uh, patients at least some sense of function and aesthetic um, um, uh, treatment to get them back online, what are the things that you think about in a situation like this? Uh, well, number one is to reassure the patient that there are possibilities to help the patient right away. So uh, and as a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I have been involved in a particular patient that happened to me that the patient left the office and just fell on the sidewalk and just had a lateral, basically, fracture of the cortical plate and the tooth was displaced. Adding to what uh, Dr. Perus has mentioned is location of the tooth properly into the socket. Now, from the point of view of the occlusion, obviously these type of situations are uh, crucial for us to make sure that we clear the uh, occlusal contact so we minimize the time for any type of trauma that we can exacerbate what the patient is going through through the process of you know, healing. Then the other thing is this type of fractures that involve uh, like in tooth number eight and number 10, obviously there has been a concussion on the two teeth 
and we want to uh, perform a procedure to cover the exposed dentin and provide some sort of a shape to the tooth structure so we can incorporate in case that we are planning to add a, a soft splint that we have the framework of the areas that we're going to be utilizing, utilizing as a, uh, a splint ready for us to perform this procedure right away. Uh, so the other thing that a, a tetanus booster, since this patient had the tooth onto the floor that could have been most probably addressed during the time that this patient was seen obviously at the hospital, but it's important to make sure that the patients are aware of this. Then I think that as we, we were discussing before this presentation, uh, planning how to provisionalize this patient. If we have able to maintain the tooth in position, obviously with the soft splint uh, where we use the 0.4 millimeter uh, you know, threaded wire with just edge, uh, a spot edge of the composite on the facial aspect that we can have across at least these three teeth or four teeth that are involved in this soft splint and making sure that we have a low profile, you know, a, um, a splint means that the bulk of this has to be in such a way that we are not inducing too much, you know, a trauma into the upper lip, for instance. And then making sure that okay. the occlusal clearance is there so we minimize direct contact with the tooth that has been evolved in this case. Got it. Very good. Now, one of the uh, questions that, that comes up in this case is, is, you know, the patient is sitting there is, and, and the tooth, the tooth is, is already in the socket. And so what's wrong with uh, keeping that tooth and splinting it? Because the other option is to have it taken out. Uh, remind you, the tooth was out for four hours, maybe not handled properly in this case. What, what are we going to expect should we decide to keep this tooth in place? What's gonna happen? I'll tell you what I'm concerned about, and I don't know if you guys agree, is um, whether or not the surface of the, the tooth is gonna take, um, whether or not there's gonna be an infection, whether or not it's gonna be stable, but is, it, is, this, is this a valid treatment? Do you think that there's any place, any, any hope for a tooth to be maintained and splinted in place? and long-term success, Peru, Zia? Uh, and, and yeah, we've, uh, we've had cases, me? actually, I was, I was talking with a colleague today who was mentioning we've, we've had cases like this that, that 10 years later are, 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 doing, um, uh, are doing very well. Um, now, a point that you make, which I think is very, very valid, is listen, uh, okay, we live in Washington, we have options. What are the downsides of keeping this tooth? What deleterious effects could there be for any future options to be performed, right? And certainly there is a chance that a case like this can, uh, we can have replacement resorption, which is ankylosis, and that, that that's gonna make it uh, potentially difficult for, for the tooth down the road to be replaced with an implant. You can you can have an infection and lose that valuable thin layer of bone that you have on, on the facial aspect of the tooth, which again is gonna make the, the, uh, the future implant a, a difficult option. Uh, so those are the downsides of, of keeping this tooth when you have other optionalities, which is why I'm, uh, um, I'm in agreement with, uh, with what you did. 